Thanks, everyone, for uh, joining the session here today. Uh, I am going to be speaking about defending against digital risks beyond your control. So I'm going to first uh, walk through a bit of a history lesson for some of you and maybe a little reminiscence for others that have uh, some gray hairs. Uh, then I'm going to... Then I'm going to talk about um, some, some real life examples of the types of things that are happening out there in this new digital world. And then we'll go in and we'll sort of model out what, what maybe can you do to defend your organizations against those types of risks. So let's get started. So first of all, you know, who am I? Um, my name is Brent Davidson. I work for a company called Zero Fox. Um, and I'm the VP of international sales, but don't let that fool you. I've been a security practitioner for over 25 years. Um, I started development, software development, moved into security network operations for 10 years in a large insurance company. And by the way, I'm, I'm from Canada, um, so don't let the accent fool you. And I now live in London. Uh, I've been here for quite some time now, and I'm really enjoying it. Um, so yeah, so then I moved over to the dark side, um, the, the vendor side, but I do have a, a great deal of experience as a security practitioner in large financial services organizations. Just a little bit about Zero Fox. I'll do the little commercial at the beginning and then a little commercial at the end, if that's okay. Um, Zero Fox has been a leader in this uh, digital risk world for about six years now. And again, I'm going to define what digital risk means, but think of sort of everything outside of the perimeter of your organization. Uh, so, um, you know, we've, we've, we're a global company, um, work with companies small and large in all different verticals, and I think as we go through the presentation, you'll see probably why. So, first of all, like I said, I'm going to define what this digital risk landscape looks like. And in order to do that, I am going to do a little bit of a history session for some, and like I said, maybe a little bit of reminiscence for others. So let's start by defining what it used to look like in the good old days. So in the good old days, for those of you who've been around for a while like me, you, know, you had your, your building, you had your computer infrastructure, your only reach out into the outside world was through your private network, right? Then the internet came along, um, so we had a little bit more to deal with. We had more than just your private network, we had more of this public network. But you still had a very defined perimeter that you had complete control over. You had control over everything that went in and everything that in and then everything that went out. Then we moved to a virtualized world, still the same sort of principles, right? You didn't really have to, it, it was, distributed across different infrastructure, but you still had, from a security perspective, the same sort of requirements, the same sort of protection. We're still dealing with firewalls, intrusion detection, uh, email security, et cetera. Then a bit of a bigger shift started to happen is as we moved into cloud computing. And I think yeah, this shift is still happening today, obviously, but in this new cloud computing world, you lose, start losing control of things. You start losing control of your, your physical infrastructure. It's now hosted by another organization that you really, other than contractual relationships um, and maybe a bit of an understanding of how they operate, don't have complete control over the infrastructure component. You're still now, you're now shifting your, your focus more from a physical centric perimeter to more of a logical, attack surface, um, you're thinking more about access controls, um, and maybe some, maybe making sure that contractual elements are in place to make sure that your, your organization is protected from multiple, multiple angles. So you're starting to see a bit of a shift in the way we go about implementing security. Still need the core infrastructure that you've always had from the perimeter perspective, but now just another layer of element to consider. Then the Big Bang the public, the introductions of operating our business in public forums. So you may ask, you know, what, what does public forums mean? And that's really what I want to talk about today is this digital network that we, that we now operate in. So this is what that looks like today, and it's changing all the time. 
And every organization, big, si big, small, every vertical, government, private sector, operates in some form or fashion in this digital space now, in these public platforms. So it could be things like social media. Um, I don't know too many organizations that, that don't operate on social media today or have some sort of presence, whether it's... And keep in mind this new digital world now, this is where we start to lose control. And we lose control of... We maybe have control over what we create, but we completely lose control about what somebody else creates. So how, are they how is our organization being represented across these channels? Social media, and I'll get into this a little bit more detail. Yeah, the web infrastructure, of course. Uh, mobile app stores, do we have any control of somebody creating a mobile app that looks like the mobile app that we created and posted out on, those, on the official app stores? Um, depending on your, on your vertical, if you're selling goods um, across the web or across digital marketplaces, do you have any control over people creating counterfeit sales or inappropriate channels being developed to, set to sell your, your goods and wares? The bottom one, news blogs, forums, review sites, this is an interesting one. I call this sort of non-traditional social presence. So is your organization being represented on things like Glassdoor or TripAdvisor or Reddit or Tumblr? Um, so things that maybe we don't think about, but when you look deeper under the covers, there may be things out there um, that people are referencing, talking about, referring to your organizations or your people or both on these channels. The deep and dark web, you know, of course, the scary dark web. What do we mean by that? Um, you know, the dark web is generally bad stuff. Uh, I think we can all agree on that. How much of the dark web is actually applicable to your organization maybe depends. Um, but if there are you know, breaches, data breaches, et cetera, possibly or probably those, 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 uh, that leakage, that information, uh, the credentials are showing up on the dark web and being sold there, or they're showing up on bin sites like Pastebin or Ghostbin. Uh, so just channels that the bad guys now are using to leverage maybe what they've stolen and distribute it or sell it. So you might want to be aware if that's, if that's happening to your organization. And again, no, you have no control over what's being published on, it, on any of these channels. Think a little bit deeper. I don't know how many how many of your organizations have official Slack channels or workplace channels, but these are also channels that you want to make sure that you've got some visibility into. Um, you know, we all probably have Active Directory in infrastructure to control most of the access points within our organization. But if somebody s spins up a maybe if one of your development organizations spin up a Slack channel to communicate internally. Do you have any control or visibility of who's being added, who's being removed, people leaving the organization, whether an external person is being added to those channels? Most organizations I talk to either don't know those channels are, exist or they, they're not aware of sort of the access control element, the coming and going of, of who has access to those channels, what information is being shared on those channels. So another area to consider that you know, a lot of organizations, as these things have bubbled up, haven't really put the same sort of controls or infrastructure or monitoring in place to, to, to make sure that they have that same visibility. So code sharing sites, it's interesting. A lot of organizations think of uh, code sharing sites like GitHub as a place where developers you know, help share, exchange, develop their code. But again, some of these things are being intentionally or unintentionally used. And we're now seeing these channels being used for other malicious purposes as well. Um, so again, my point here is twofold. One, you need to have or you should have visibility in place. You should be looking at this digital world exactly the same way as you look at the rest of your business. So think about standard security practices where you have your technology stack, and that could be applications, that could be hardware, it could be your network infrastructure. You, you protect that tech stack. I would challenge you to think, and that's one of the objectives of today, is to make sure that I challenge you, not just to scare you, but challenge your thinking about this digital landscape. Um, and whether you're applying the same sort of controls, monitoring, 
due diligence on these digital assets that are part of your tech stack. And I will argue uh, to the death that these are, this now is a world that's, that's part of your tech stack and should be treated as such. Anybody disagree with that? That's a, kind of a loaded question, but um, so let's layer one more element to it. Um, first of all, the bad guys are operating in this world, right? It's so easy to look at these channels. Before, it was very difficult to um, spoof or trick people into engaging with our organization because we had complete control over it. Now, it's so easy for the bad guys to leverage these channels, create impersonations of your organization in a very trusted fashion, right? They can impersonate your organization from a brand perspective using your logo, using the exact replication of your social media sites, um, creating fake websites altogether that look identical to yours that are phishing sites, um, creating fraudulent email. So the bad guys are leveraging these public platforms now. It's now their number one strategy. Uh, it also costs them next to nothing, right? Before, in order to attack an infrastructure, they had to put a lot of investment. Now you can download some shareware, some freeware, open source information or applications, and you can, you can duplicate a website, you can duplicate a social media presence of an executive, a brand, et cetera, with a click of a button. It's just instant, it's so easy, there's no cost. There's also no controls from the social networks. Like nobody's out there, uh, it'd be great if they were, but it's a real challenge for them. Nobody's out there, like Facebook or Instagram, and I'm not putting them down, it's the world they operate in. They don't have responsibility or controls in place to protect you. Now, I often draw this, it's interesting because you think, okay, well they should, but then I, you know, I could draw the same analogy from an email perspective. Nobody's coming down on Microsoft because somebody's spoofing emails or, and I use Microsoft just, just as an example, you know, why is, it's not Microsoft's responsibility to protect you from email scams. Why do we think it's Facebook's responsibility to protect you from social media scams? So just think of those perspectives as you're, as you're kind of thinking about where your organization's being represented. Now, we've got the bad guys over here. We've got our organization over here. There's also another layer that we've never had, to, as InfoSec professionals, that we've never really had to deal with to the degree that we have to deal with it today. You know, we used to, uh, we used to remember, protect the data and the infrastructure in this little tiny circle here. We now have to, for the first time ever, think about how the bad guys are attacking our customers, leveraging <coughs> our brand or impersonations of our executives or our key individuals because um, that's what they're doing, right? They're bypassing this whole component to get at your data. Your data is, is a representation really of your customers. So they're bypassing this and they're now as close to your customer in this world as you are, right? Your, your marketing teams are using your websites, your social media presence to engage with your customers, your employees, your partners. The bad guys have the exact same distance between them and your customers. So that's a really kind of scary thought when we boil it down and think about it from that angle. And they're leveraging the fact that you're creating followers, you're creating engagement, because they, they, that's what they're after. That, they're after that engagement. And they want, to, they want to attack your customers directly using that trust and that engagement that you've built up in your organization. Fair? All right, you know, just another just example, the types of things that you should be thinking about that the bad guys are leveraging across these channels. Um, certainly phishing, uh, phishing has just escalated and skyrocketed. And the phishing component now, it used to be simple, right? It used to be you know, monitor for email phishing campaigns. There are now targeted campaigns using everything from email to social media to web to text yeah, SMS and now deep fakes. Um, that, that's a whole other element that I haven't brought in yet, but that's the newest scare now is phishing, via, phishing or other scams via deep fakes, leveraging that technology. Uh, but think about things, and we'll walk through some examples of these, but you know, hacked social media accounts. I mean, we've seen lots of examples of that right up to you know, Twitter themselves, Jack Dorsey being, being hacked. And so 
do we have the same sort of controls in place for our social media presence as we do for our, the rest of our infrastructure? And remember now that our social media presence isn't just our corporate-owned Facebook and Twitter accounts. It's our CEO's accounts. It's our network administrator's accounts. It's our DBA's account. And are we protecting those with the same diligence? And what would happen, like those of us who have done like detailed risk assessments, what would happen if your CEO's Twitter or Facebook account got hacked or their LinkedIn account got hacked and that being used, started being used in a malicious way? You know, do we have the response systems in place? Do we have the remediation plans in place? How would we deal with those types of examples? Um, who would get the phone call? Uh, would it be, yeah, this is an interesting one because when we often talk to organizations and you start to talk about social media, they say, oh, that's marketing. Well, I mean, just, would you, well, you've, you've got a web presence, right? You've, you've built that up. Who uses your, mar your website? It's your marketing department, right? No question. They're the ones that create that engagement, uh, unless you're using it from an e-commerce you know, e perspective, but it's still sort of marketing driven. Would you ever trust your marketing department to implement your web application firewall? Not a chance. Are you trusting your market? And this isn't a slam on marketing. This isn't their job. Are you trusting your marketing department to put in the security controls, monitoring, infrastructure to protect your social media presence? Because that's the presence that's now being used. Is your CEO's social media presence protected? Has anybody thought of that? Really, those are the types of things that, as security professionals now, we need to be thinking about every engagement channel, like I said, as part of your technology stack. Um, the domains, we'll walk through these really quickly here. Domain spoofing, uh, that's again rampant, but again, not just individually on its own, but, we were, but domains being spoofed, then MX records being used to create um, email phishing campaigns that are then tied into social media campaigns that are asking you to DM them separately. And you know, it's, again, it's this complex world now, and the bad guys are 24-7 you know, figuring out how to, how to leverage that engagement. To, to execute their scams and their hacks. Consumer scams we talked about a little bit. Trade, trademark infringements, uh, brand and executive impersonations, reputation damage. Yeah, this is where marketing does come into play, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, information leakage. So also think of those channels not just as a risk, but think of them maybe as an opportunity to gain some intelligence, to gain some situational awareness. Now let's use Twitter as an example. I mean, if anything happens in the world about anything, where does it hit first? Where can you learn about it first? It's Twitter. I mean, it'll be Twitter before it's emergency services, before it's your corporate security team, before it's your marketing team, before it's your infosec team. It will be, it'll be out there on Twitter somewhere, very, very, within seconds. And it can go viral. Um, it maybe doesn't, but just, be aware that, that it can also be, these channels can also be a positive source of intelligence. Um, you know, offensive content can tie in sort of a marketing reputation perspective. Often we don't think of compliance violations, but now again, do, have, we, have we layered in the same policies, controls uh, across our social communications as we have with the rest of our compliance um, regime? Like do we, you know, Social media is now a communica communication channel for all your employees. Do you have those policies? Are you monitoring against those policies? Do you have the means to control from a client compliance perspective to protect yourself from any compliance risk? And then physical violence, again, uh, that's sort of back to the Twitter example where you can gain really quick information about any sort of physical uh, or beyond physical, let's say there's a protest in your uh, on the street that your building operates is pre that's preventing your customers to get to your to your office or your employees to get to your office. You may want to know about stuff like that. That's maybe taking it to the to another layer for some organizations, but uh, depending on the operations of your organizations, that could be critical. Make sense so far? All right, well, let's actually look walk through some quick examples of tactics and then we'll we'll talk about sort of how you might want to think about this. I'm going to go through this fairly quickly just because of the limitation of time. 
Um, but like I said before, this is a compounding problem. The bad guys are leveraging multiple channels in different ways. There's hardly a week goes by that there's not something in the press now that talks about a breach across some of these channels or data leakage. Um, and let's dive into a few of those. So there's certainly fraudulent accounts. A big one, and it's probably hard to read, but a big one is the impersonation of your support organization. Um, it's so easy to create a, yeah, Apple helps, and the L is now a capital I, and it's indis indistinguishable from the human eye, um, and that channels to start to get, engage with your customers in yeah, any sort of phishing attack or PII kind of gathering. Um, so we're seeing a lot of that type of activity. There's a really famous one with NatWest where their customer engagement channel, um, a legitimate channel, chatting back and forth with their customers, but a fake account that looked just like NatWest. So exactly the same, except it didn't have this little blue check mark, but how many of us as we're going back and forth, you know, engaging with a, a, um, a vendor that we, that we believe we trust, actually take the time to look at every single line item. So the, the bad guys inserted a, just a response to a question saying, hey, you know, reach out, click on this link, we'll, we'll help you from here. So again, diverting sort of that traffic, so it's traffic diversion from the, the actual channel to a fake channel that looks very real. And it happens in an instant, right? You're probably on your phone, you're not looking at detail, you're maybe not looking at the number of followers or whether that blue check mark's there. It can happen in an instant. And then that trust and that engagement with your customer is diverted to the bad guys. Account hijacking. Um, I love this one, a local example, Tesco. Their account was recently hacked. So if you can't read the date, it's June 25th, 2019 was when this hit the press. Um, their Twitter account gets hacked. It actually then starts uh, imitating Bill Gates and starts engaging with customers as Bill Gates. So that's an interesting one, isn't it, where they've now just changed the entire communication channel. It's no longer Tesco, it's Bill Gates. So again, the creativity of the bad guys is incredible. And I mean, well, you can look into this one on your own, but uh, that's yeah, another great recent example. The bad guys are out there waiting to pounce, right? And they're watching these channels. So you know, obviously we all know Thomas Cook, the failure. Within instance almost, there were fake domains, fake social presences, giving refunds, exactly, offering refunds, uh, to the point where the UK Civil, Civil Aviation Authority had to step in and start breaking this down and monitoring this environment and taking control over it. So just like that, the bad guys are pouncing on opportunistic um, incidents, let's call it. You know, it. It wasn't anything that, well, obviously Thomas Cook failure out of their control, but the bad guys are leveraging that significantly. Um, lots of you know, fake websites now, like I said, are just a dime a dozen. Uh, we've done a few research reports that just show, I think it's on the average of one or two a week now, there's uh, fake websites being being created to, you know, fish and scam, et cetera. Phishing, again, uh, I talked about this one a little bit, but, you know, everything from, you know, huge scams across, you know, government organizations. Uh, the, the UK uh, government is one of the most um, attacked organizations from a scam perspective. Uh, but, again, social media, financial services organizations, it's so easy for them to you know, cr create a tweet or a post with you know, a shortened link that you can't hover over anymore and determine what the destination is. So again, they're leveraging multiple tactics now. And one thing I learned that's really cool, you can create your own custom sh link shorteners with your own brand. I just learned that myself last week in, uh, in, a, in a forum like this. So there are things that we can start to do to, to tighten this up a little bit. but. The bad guys using shortened links is now a common tactic across you know, websites, social media, and any kind of uh, um, external channel engagement. Brand fraud, I mean, that's kind of an obvious one, uh, and it's amazing how 
scams have transitioned from you know, the old telephone scams, the Nigerian print scams, uh, are now rampant across social media. But other, you know, if you're in the retail space, you know, fake coupons, uh, consumer scams, um, directly again use, like I said before, directly using your brand to target your customers. And who's responsible for that? Right? Just that's the thought-provoking thing of this example. Uh, is your organization responsible for this presence? You didn't create it, right? Is it the consumer's responsibility to validate whether they're clicking on yeah, an impersonated brand? Um, there are some debates out there, but I'll also tell you that there are some geographies and governments now that are leaning towards um, making it the organization's responsibility, the brand's responsibility. Australia is actually leading the charge on this, and I think they're really close if they've not already passed or passing or passed regulations um, that you are now, the organizations operating in Australia are now responsible for their brand presence, whether it's fake or not. So think about that and the implications of how your organization might need to respond if, that, if we get to that, to that length. But even just from a consumer confidence perspective, um, I don't think there's anybody that doesn't want their brand being represented in a positive way that maintains that trust. You're investing hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars in consumer engagement. You know, one fake account can, uh, can destroy all that. As a matter of fact, I think there was a study in Ray-Ban that is one of the most um, impersonated brands out there, and their marketing spend now is something like 10 times a normal marketing spend because they have to try and validate their actual presence versus a fake presence. So an interesting dynamic of how to think about it from a business perspective and the costs associated with not getting out, of, out front of brand protection. Piracy and counterfeit goods, very similar just uh, yeah, to, the, to the brand fraud, except these are actually fake goods being sold, not scams using your brand um, to entice people to, into like phishing campaigns or stealing their personal information. And then last but not least, information leakage, whether that's you know, intentional leakage of your corporate user IDs and passwords, or whether that's unintentional, uh, you know, people being proud of their new credit card and taking pictures. We saw one scam, when well, it was a scam, somebody posted the front and somebody responded, oh, that's awesome, can you show us the back? <laughs> uh, yeah. We laugh, but I mean, we're, we're professionals, right? We think about those things. You know, there are people that, that don't. Um, we've seen multiple scams for badge readers or, yeah, again, people taking, I mean, this, this code, whether it's a badge or whether it's you know, your winnings in a casino um, being posted and being stolen, um, you know, that, that being printed off is no different. Those QR codes or, or those codes are live as soon as they're printed off if you've taken that picture. So um, lots of different things to think about depending on the industry that you're in and, and how you leverage uh, your security infrastructure. Physical threats, again, I mentioned this earlier, but there's an opportunity to leverage this you know, digital space to get to gain awareness instantly. So how can you defend this? First of all, you need to get your teams working together. I mean, for the first time ever, marketing, security, physical, digital, all should be talking about how these, how this infrastructure is being rolled out, leveraged, monitored, controlled, um, much more than ever before. And you know, marketing teams should be challenging security, and security should be challenging marketing to make sure that these are properly secured. The way that I suggest that organizations look at it is first of all, have a digital protection strategy. Put something in place so that you have some level of preparedness. Um, and what does that mean? It means make sure you at least identify your, your own digital presence. Define what your digital assets are, what you want to protect. Understand you know, whether your brand or your executives, your data, your employees, your locations. Understand, ask yourself the question, what would happen if? Right? That's a common security practice when you're talking about your tech stack or your assets. Put the monitoring in place. And you, you, know, you, have to have, you have to be using the same or better technology than the bad guys are using. They're using artificial intelligence. They're using machine learning. They're using images. They're using, 
They're embedding text within images. Um, you need to be able to combat their tactics with the same types of technologies. And by the way, this is evolving so fast and there's so much data out there that you just can't rely on technology. I mean, we're a technology vendor, but there also has to be a, a human la layer to it um, to make sure that you're understanding the breadth and depth and some of the new challenges that are, that are hitting you on a daily basis. And then last but not least, it's great if we learn all about this stuff, but you need to have some level of sort of threat, feeding your threat intelligence programs, but more so have a remediation plan in place, be able to react and respond quickly. I mentioned you need to have the same technology, so that's machine learning, it's artificial intelligence, it's natural language processing, and it's things like optical character recognition, image detection, that's, that's the way the bad guys are um, con communicating with your organization. Deep fakes, again, will add a whole new layer of voice and video elements to how they're leveraging your, your existence. So how do we make sense of the space? Really, it, there's multiple sort of channels that have evolved. Threat intelligence, every vendor out there now is a threat intelligence vendor, so good luck with that one. Um, Social media protection, that's been around for a long time, brand and social protection. Um, and that's probably the way your marketing department looks at it. The space, I think, is really devol evolving into this digital risk protection and encompassing the intersection of all of these worlds. And this is where you probably want to operate. So yeah, obviously, we can't go through all this. But my thought-provoking element, again, to you is really decide what's important to you, which one of these elements is important to you? Is it visibility of a whole bunch of different types of threats? Is it protecting your social media presence? Is it maybe gaining threat and vulnerability information? Uh, is it understanding hacker attack planning or breach planning? Um, and or is it looking at other threat indicators that may be evolving across a broader set of infrastructure? Do you have the resources in place to leverage pure threat intelligence? Or do you need to have something that's a little more defined and actionable rather than a broad set of industry threat intelligence? So just think about how you, what you want to protect, how you want to protect it, and sort of what are the dynamics of this space that best fit your organization. There's not a, a one, one sort of one size fits all. So my last little commercial. Um, Zero, the Zero Fox is in the business of monitoring all those digital channels, literally thousands of digital channels in an automated way, leveraging those technologies that we talked about, machine learning, policies, rules, artificial intelligence, image detection, picture identification, advanced images, creating or using threat intelligence both as an, as an input and also helping to produce it. A one-click one remediation process for all social media, bin sites, um, web applications, like web domain spoofing, uh, mobile apps. Um, so very quick. I don't know if any of you have ever had to take, do a takedown. That's the, the common language in sort of social media domains and mobile apps. Uh, it can be an arduous legal process. Uh, with Zero Fox, it's a click of a button. Also make sure that you're integrating with your other technologies or at least have the opportunity to if you need to. And you're also then layering in some level of human al analysis and element for that sort of alert triage and threat intelligence. And that's really what ZeroFox does across our customer base on a global, from a global perspective. So again, I, I thank you for your time. I really hope that, again, if nothing else, I created some thoughts and stuff that you can take back and at least start the process of thinking how your organizations are protecting themselves against sort of the di this new digital presence and public platforms. I don't know if we have time for any questions. If not, you can find us downstairs, of course, in the, in the vendor area. All right, well, thank you very much. Appreciate it.